Well, I'm Jay Doucette. I'm a, a general and trauma surgeon by training. I'm also a, a, a surgical intensivist who uh, have some experience with uh, chemical warfare. Um, I always spent 22 years in the Canadian Forces, and the Canadian Forces uh, has a long experience with chemical warfare as well, being one of the first armies ever to be gassed uh, in 1915 in a place called Ypres. Uh, and since then, it's always been a matter of interest. That was me back in 1991. Uh, that's uh, in the Kuwaiti Saudi desert. That's when Saddam still had his weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> and uh, we thought he might use them. And we spent an awful lot of time in that war wearing a charming outfits like this, which I tell you in 110 degree heat is a real treat. Um, and uh, so we got very, very uh, tuned in to dealing with uh, a type of attack involving chemical weapons. Chemical weapons have been used. This wasn't the only attack by, the, by this cult in Japan. They actually made some other attacks before. Uh, for the previous attack they made didn't even, wasn't even noticed. Actually killed five people. Nobody even knew what they died of. Um, so if you don't suspect what's going on, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. And unfortunately, in Tokyo, because of the you know, non-recognition of the event and the unavailability of antidote, all those patients who suffered uh, arrest uh, before, or, uh, before the hospital stayed dead. Nobody who arrested, all, all patients who died, died outside of the hospital. And um, you know, their understanding of the response and how to respond wasn't that great. What the, the attack was basically is members of the group went to five different subway cars in Tokyo during the morning rush hour. And that rush, that Tokyo subway system moves over half a million people in that period. They took five, basically, what were IV bags and filled them with sarin and then wrapped them in newspaper. And then the, the person uh, deploying it basically poked the bag with the tip of their umbrella before they left the car. And it wasn't even a very sophisticated attack, very crude. The sarin just leaked out of the bag onto the seat and onto the floor which is a very crude way of delivering a, a nerve agent. And there is actually a nerve agent on the floor, and there is a police officer with no protective equipment whatsoever standing next to it. But uh, because of the crude nature of the agent and its uh, poor volatility, that's how he didn't actually die almost instantly being that close to the agent. So why, do, why would somebody want to use a chemical weapon or nerve agents on somebody? Well, if you compare toxicity of various types of things that somebody might try to use to exterminate people, um, things like chlorine uh, and phosgene or even cyanide, when you compare the toxicity you know, by, uh, by exposure to things like sarin or VX, you can see that these things you know, are very, very toxic in minuscule doses. And therefore, if you want the most bang for your buck, a nerve agent is the way to go. The terrorists know that. What kind of agents are out there? They have various names. Um, I'm not going to get too much into these. Um, why are there so many different kinds? Well, most of them were evolved for use in warfare against armies, and there are very issues in terms of how volatile they are, how long they last on surfaces, whether or not they break down in sunlight quickly or not. And so as a result, um, they have different um, capabilities. Sarin, which is one of the easier ones to make, is non-persistent, which means it breaks down pretty rapidly uh, all by itself. Where, uh, and the ones that start with G are, from the, are named after the Germans because they were developed by the German chemical industry uh, during the First World War. VX was actually a British-American co-production, and it's very toxic and very persistent, so it stays active for days after it's been sprayed on a surface. Luckily, the formula, the recipe for VX is a closely guarded secret, not easy to make. So these compounds, what they are actually, they're, they have the name for them, organic phosphorus compounds. And the reason they're called that is basically you have a, a molecule with a phosphorus in it, and it's organic. It has a, a, a carbon on it. And this particular molecule is sarin, not a very sophisticated molecule. It can cause death in uh, uh, 1 to 10 minutes. And uh, it does this by causing what's called an acute cholinergic crisis. These compounds are not all that rare. In fact, you probably have some in your house. If you have any insecticides, many insecticides are organophosphorus compounds. Of course, they are optimized for use against insects and not against people. But if you get a large enough exposure, you can also have a cholinergic crisis. And there have been instances of people falling into, into vats of insecticide and whatnot, getting severe cholinergic crisis. And so these kinds of compounds uh, are used in, in people's houses. If you have anything like malathion in your house, that's, a, that's an organic phosphorus compound. It's basically a relative of, of serum. So these agents, I mean, how to make them? 
Well, if you look hard enough, it's not hard to find out. You don't have to have much knowledge of organic chemistry to make these agents. And uh, if you go on the right websites and the right bookstores, you can find the recipe. So, I mean, it's not just a matter of other countries or foreign terrorists. It's always a possibility for domestic terrorists as well. Sometimes uh, you just need one crazy person with a chemistry bent, and away you go. How do these agents work? Well, they, they basically are called nerve agents because that's where they, where they work. The, the nature of my talk is going to be fairly basic, so if, you're, if you have more sophisticated knowledge than at the level I'm presenting, don't, don't be upset because this, uh, this talk is, is basically derived from talks that are given to soldiers, and soldiers don't uh, usually want to spend too much time in physiology. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the, the agents work at, ner at nerves, and basically the nerves communicate with each other at places called synapses or gaps between the nerves. And the most common neurotransmitter, that is a chemical that goes from one nerve to another, is acetylcholine. Okay, that's the most common neurotransmitter. And how does that work? Well, an electrical impulse which travels down the membrane to the end of the nerve reaches the end plate or uh, the presynaptic area. And those little acetylcholine molecules are stored there. When the electric impulse gets there, they get, uh, diffuse out into solution uh, in, the, uh, in the synapse, and then they get on the other end they hit receptors and that causes the nerve uh, impulse to be propagated. You don't want that to be permanent so you do have some little enzymes sitting around there called acetylcholinesterase and they actually can uh, float into these areas of receptors and actually chew up the acetylcholine after a very few short period of time and actually stop the impulse. So if there is not continued release of uh, acetylcholine, the acetylcholine, the impulse will go away. So after a short time the, acetyl the impulse is gone. So there are two major kinds of acetylcholine receptors at that postsynaptic nerve, okay? They're called the muscarinic, or we'll often call it the first type, which basically are uh, found on smooth muscles, exocrine glands, the cranial nerves like the vagus, and the other kind are called nicotinic, and they're mostly, they're the second kind, they're found mostly at skeletal muscles. That has an implication because because there are two kinds of receptors, you actually need two kinds of antidote. And that's why you're, we're talking mostly about these two different drugs. Now, they're also nicotinic at preglanglionic nerves. That uh, is not too important for this. Both kinds of receptors are actually found in the brain. So the muscarinic ones, these are the ones found at smooth muscle. What do I mean by smooth muscle? Well, the muscle that lines the airways, that's smooth muscle. In the GI tract, that's all smooth muscle as well, and in the pupils. So what happens is when there's too much, uh, when there is a lot of acetylcholine around, all these things constrict. So in the airways, that will cause bronchoconstriction. You may know that one of the common drugs for asthma is atropine, which actually can break that effect. GI tract constricts. Uh, if you have somebody who's got a lot of GI cramping, you may give them some, a drug like uh, muscopan, which is an anticholinergic, and the pupils constrict. In terms of glands, when the acetylcholine is released near them, they all produce fluid. The eyes will tear, the nose will run, the mouth produces saliva, sweat glands produce sweat, and uh, airways produce a lot of mucus. The GI tract will have a lot of uh, output, so you may have uh, um, vomiting or diarrhea coming out of either end. And the vagal response causes uh, bradycardia, so there may be a, a slow heart rate. So how do these nerve agents work? Well, basically they impede, they actually uh, stop the effect of acetylcholinesterase. They basically attack that enzyme and cause too much acetylcholine to be uh, present. So what you end up with is too much acetylcholine. So the initial effects, you may notice, uh, pinpoint pupils are very common. The patient may also have some uh, nicotinic or secondary effects which will cause beyond the muscles. So the muscle may be tremorous or maybe shaky or fasciculating as uh, sometimes called and that may have progressed to seizures and they can be a, an effect called sludge. So sludge is salivation, lacrimation, urination, diaphoresis, gastrointestinal which is diarrhea and cramps and emesis or vomiting. So these patients become basically they have fluid coming out of every orifice. That's pretty hard to miss. That's a pretty specific finding. Now, if you see one patient like that, you might miss it. If you see two patients like that, that should get you pretty curious. If you see multiple patients with this syndrome, it's nerve agent. There's almost nothing else that does this, okay? It's, it's, it's very specific. 
Yeah, if you've uh, had, had older training or in the military, another term for it is also called dumbbells, but we, we'll just use sludge for, for our purposes. The pinpoint pupils is a big giveaway, and it's very specific uh, in terms of the duration. These agents, uh, once they actually get into uh, to the eye, they will cause vasoconstriction that literally take as much as 60 some days to resolve, even with a minimal exposure to vapor. So it's very specific, the pinpoint pupils for nerve agent poisoning. So how does the nerve agent work? As I said, acetylcholine esterase is inhibited. It can't destroy acetylcholine. And so basically that impulse doesn't get terminated. It basically continues to stimulate the organ. So here comes the nerve agent, and those little Pac-Men are chewing up uh, the acetylcholine like they're supposed to. And it gets in there, and they can't chew it up anymore. And all the acetylcholine just stays there and keeps activating the nerve. And the nerve gets switched on and can't switch off. So all those effects are occur. So how do we look after patients who've been exposed to nerve agent? Most importantly, you have to protect yourself. So if you're actually out where the agent is, it's important not to actually get yourself uh, mixed up with the agent because then you become a victim yourself. Um, luckily, for the typical kinds of scenarios, if you're at the hospital, that's not likely to be an issue. But if you're at the scene itself, it, it can be an issue. So first responders have to have protective gear and they have to be able to decontaminate the casualty. At the facility, if you recognize that you're basically dealing with some kind of hazmat incident and there's contamination of the casualties, it's important not to bring them into the facility and contaminate the facility and make it useless as well because if all the, all the rooms and all the beds and all the paper personnel are also covered in the agent, that becomes a problem as well. However, that does not have to impede um, treatment and that's one of the reasons why the auto injectors are so popular. So treatment, basically, we're going to have two concepts. If it's wet, which is so these patients are very wet, we'll make them dry. And if they're fast, we'll make them slow. And by fast, what I'm talking about is the motor activity, the fasciculations, the seizures, okay, or the rapid or the in, uh, incoordinated movements or whatever. Those are all things that you have to slow down. So the nerve agents, like I said, the first type acting at the muscarinic, those are all the secretions that are made and all the uh, GI mortality and the patient gets very wet. So how do we deal with that? Well, the antidote for that is atropine. And the second one, the nicotinic, these are mostly at, at skeletal muscle and that's all these muscle effects I mentioned, muscle twitches, weakness, paralysis, and seizures. You have to treat those with the, the TUPAM. A lot of people know about the atropine, but they often forget about the TUPAM. But the TUPAM is very important because even though the atropine will get rid of the, the bronchoconstriction, the extra secretions, it makes it possible for the patient to breathe more easily or be bagged more readily. If you don't deal with the nicotinic thing, their muscle weakness will not resolve. And then you, they may have a problem that you may clear up their secretions and their airways, but they may be so weak they may not be able to breathe or move on their own. So the uh, agents are basically atropine and TUPAM, which are combined in a uh, Mark I nerve agent kit. Uh, of course, this is combined with decontamination. And if patients have severe exposure or require large doses, they're probably also going to need some kind of a benzodiazepine. The common one used in the, is uh, diazepam because of its uh, storage capabilities. Decontamination. Well, the most common agent that we've probably seen would be sarin, and it doesn't need too much decontamination because it tends to break down fairly quickly. and doesn't have a lot of risk to responders because it doesn't luckily st um, stay in the environment very long. And probably in terms of patients coming to a hospital, if their clothes are removed, and particularly if they're washed down with some water, that's probably all that's required. Um, if somebody was able to get a hold of VX, that would be a real problem because that can, that can actually stay in the environment for days and be, can be spread from person to person, but luckily that agent's not very likely to be used. There are also something else called dusty agents, but I'm not going to get too much into that. That's a, a bit of a military thing. Um, hopefully, I don't think any terrorists will know how to make those. Um, skin I'm not going to get too much into decontamination, but basically the, the sooner the better. Most of the uh, benefit is very quickly, within one or two minutes. If it's left on the skin for more than half an hour, it's pretty much all absorbed, uh, if it's going to be absorbed. And basically, physically removing the agent from the, person, the, from the patient. So getting those clothes off, getting anything on them that may be contaminated off. And if you don't have water, use anything you can, a stick, a dirt, whatever it takes to get it off. Um, 
you can try to make the solution better by adding things like soaps and bleaches, but the time involved in doing that and, and the extra effort probably isn't even worth it because the, the speed is of the essence. The two drugs, atropine, it's an anticholinergic blocking drug. It blocks excess acetylcholine, so it actually goes to the postsynaptic nerve and basically plugs up some of those receptors so that ex excess acetylcholine can't have so much effect. But it only works at the muscarinic sites. It doesn't work at skeletal muscle. It only affects with that, that wet part, the, the bronchoconstriction and all those secretions. So dry secretions gets rid of things like bronchospasm and GI cramps, but it doesn't actually do anything about the weakness. The typical dose, two or six milligrams, depending on whether or not you think it's uh, a uh, mild or severe exposure. And then if it's not uh, working or wears off, you keep giving every two milligrams, usually every five minutes uh, until you have enough. You keep giving atropine until those secretions dry up and their ventilations get better. The usual dose for severe casualty can be as high as 15 or 20 milligrams, which could be as many as anywhere from three to 10 auto injectors for a severe exposure. Uh, but there's some in, uh, cases of uh, insecticide poisoning, even out in Imperial County, if somebody falls into a vat of malathion or something like that, where they've actually had to give as much as a gram of atropine. Um, that doesn't happen very often, but... And basically, I said, it, it stops the effect by antagonizing, uh, competing for those receptors for, for the uh, uh, acetylcholine. And uh, for adults, it's two milligrams. Now, for children, the dose is either 0.5 or 1. But the children, uh, you have to have the atropin uh, for that. And the problem we have is um, for children, we don't have smaller two-pam injectors. Uh, so depending on what you've got available, if you only have the adult size auto injectors and that's all you've got, then that's what you'll have to use. And even though the dose will be about three times what you need for a moderate exposure, it's still better to give it and save the child's life than to risk, uh, risk going without because the, the consequence of, of significant exposure is death. And that, uh, that philosophy has actually been endorsed in the literature as well. If you have no choice, you use the adult injectors in them. So atropine blocks secretions and gets the wet patient dry. And it's usually a, a, the green injector, okay? And a smaller injector in a, two, in a Mark uh, I kit. The oxime, the 2-PAM, it works at the nicotinic site. And what it does is it basically, um, at the acetylcholine esterase at nicotinic sites, it basically increases muscle strength. And it does that by basically coming along the acetylcholine and basically crowbarring or uh, taking off that nerve agent that affects that acetylcholine esterase. And that's an important effect because that's the only thing that's going to get muscle strength back in the skeletal muscle. So that helps the patient who's fasciculating or weak get, uh, get slow. Now, there is an issue in that the nerve agent, the longer it's on the acetylcholinesterase at the nicotinic site, the better a bond it gets. And eventually, it becomes permanent. And that acetylcholinesterase is basically become, becomes useless. And they will not generate uh, more acetylcholinesterase for days. So that patient, if they're very weak or paralyzed, may stay that way. And so, again, time is of the essence. If you don't give the, um, the 2-PAM quickly enough, it won't work anymore. Okay, and the how long that takes depends on the agent. Luckily for sarin, it's about three to four hours. After three to four hours, 2-PAM probably won't have any effect. If it's SOMAN, which is not a very common agent, um, it's as little as two minutes. After two minutes of exposure, uh, those acetylcholinesterase enzymes are, are done. Um, but again, luckily, that's uh, not a common agent and not likely to be encountered. So 2-PAM. It's in the larger syringe. It's usually either uh, tan or gray. And it's uh, 600 milligrams. It's 300 milligrams per ml and 2 mls. And um, if uh, you were to give it a smaller amount, you probably would give about 50 to 100 milligrams to a child for a mild to moderate exposure. But again, that um, is only if you had the multi-dose vials. And the third drug is diazepam. And basically, it stops seizures. Seizures are more common in somebody who's been taking the the pretreatment, the pretreatment antidote is um, peridostigmine, but that's not commonly seen uh, outside of the military world. Uh, if you get nerve gas exposure, the peridostigmine actually gives a little bit of protection for a while, but then once it's overwhelmed, the patient's very likely to get seizures. But in the case of uh, 
the civilian world, it's mostly severe exposure. So generally speaking, if you have to give three or more auto-injectors, you're going to give the patient the, uh, the uh, Valium. So a complete Mark I kit would consist of a atropine auto-injector, 2 milligrams, a 2-PAM chloride injector for 600 milligrams, and for three of these, you get one auto-injector of Valium. And what will happen in, for firefighters, first responders, or soldiers, they'll carry basically three of these kits and one Valium auto-injector, and that's enough for the initial treatment of a single victim. So basically, they'll carry um, three of these plus a um, uh, Valium auto-injector. So there they are, a little closer up. That's the way it is. And it's made simple, you know, being military. One is the first one you use, and the two is the second one you use. You have the atropine first, but you follow it very quickly with the two pan. Um, there's, as newer things come along, there's more and more combination. Outside the United States, many other countries have a single auto injector that combines the atropine and the two pan. And when that happens, you have a single auto injector. So if you see that, like the duodote, which eventually will show up, it's a single auto injector, but it's got both drugs in the same, in the same auto injector. How do you use these? Basically, what you need to do is you'll get the kit, and the real kit, these are the trainers, but the real kit looks uh, identical, except it doesn't say uh, auto inject, uh, practice treat kind of on it. When you pull it out, Okay, it looks like that. It's got two parts to it. And you got a one and a two clearly labeled on it. It basically, when you pull it out, it now is ready to fire. Okay, that's important to know because if you accidentally brush it against something hard enough, it will fire. The needle comes out, it's about uh, three quarters of an inch. It's an 18 gauge needle. And having experience of actually injected uh, trial ones of these with saline in them, it, it, you feel it, especially when the, when the uh, fluid goes into your leg. Basically, if you had to give it to yourself uh, or anybody else, the best place to give it is in the anterior thigh, over here, anterior lateral thigh here, nice muscle part of the thigh. And basically, it's pushed against the thigh until it fires. And once you've fired that one in, you've got to hold that in for 10 seconds. We'll, we'll emphasize that uh, to make sure there's enough time for all the fluid to go in. Once the one goes in, you take the second one, you fire it in as well, just like a pencil. Yeah, there it goes. And again, you hold that for 10 seconds, whether it's yourself or, or the victim. And you basically, once you've done that, that's the treatment. If you have to give more, you give more for severe exposure, depending on the symptoms. We'll talk about that when we do our little, we'll do some practice sessions here. And these things, the advantage of these is that you don't have to start an IV. You can inject these right through clothing. We'll show a video of that. And it is the fastest way to give the antidote. One of the problems you saw in the, in the sarin video of Tokyo is basically they're there trying to start IVs in literally hundreds and hundreds of people. Just starting IVs in 100 people all at once would take so long that it wouldn't be worth it. Whereas if you use the auto injectors, you can give it. And luckily, unless the patient's in very severe hemodynamic shock, the atropine and 2-PAM are very well absorbed from perfused muscle. So it doesn't matter how you give it so much. So there's a spot you aim for. Okay, you don't want to give it in the back of the leg because the sciatic nerve is back there. You don't want to give it on the inside of the leg because that's where the vessels are. So the nice beefy part of the leg out here, that's where you put it. Basically the same place you're, if you had a pocket, that's where you get it. Now of course if you've got stuff in your pocket, like I always got a, something in there, you don't want to inject it through that. So you got that stuff out of the pocket. We'll show that in the video as well. So how do you grade mild patients? The pupils, maybe some fissiculations, a runny nose, kind of sal saliving, spitting up or drooling a bit or having to swallow a lot of saliva, maybe increasing but not too bad short of breath, maybe one mark one. So num one number one, num one number two, and see how they do. If they dry up and get slow, that looks okay. Severe, particularly if they have problems, real severe problems with breathing or apnea or flaccid or having a seizure or unconscious. You give them three Mark ones right off, one after the other, and give them the Valium. And then you wait a short time and see if you get an effect. Now, if they're actually arresting, then you'll have to support them, just like ACLS. You have to support anybody going into respiratory arrest. But, you know, time is of the essence. If you wait in a patient with, who's developing severe respiratory problems after organophosphorus or nerve agent, you know, they'll be dead very shortly. 
And that's one of the problems with these, these agents is that if in very severe exposures, they have to be, people have to be treated very quickly. That's why not just the emergency departments and hospitals have to have them, that's why the fire departments have them, because you basically have to bring the agent to the scene. Um, you can't wait for the patient to come to the hospital in every case. Um, so like I said, just a review. If it's wet, make it dry. If it's fast, make it slow. And you're gonna give one to three Mark Ones. If you give three Mark Ones, give an anticonvulsant. And if it's, uh, they're still having issues, you may have to provide an airway, and you may have to give more atropine after that. And you may have to give up the 10 atropines, depending on what's going on. Like I said, can be injected with clothing. Hold the jaw to inject in place for 10 seconds. This will all be reinforced in the video. May be used before decon. The decon team, people outside can give these auto-injectors. Firefighters can give them outside of the, uh, before decontamination. They can be shot right through clothing. And we talked about how to use this. We basically take it out. Once they're out, they're ready to fire. Put them against the leg. Hold in place for 10 seconds after firing it. Just for safety's sake, this hold like a pencil. If you mistakenly take the colored in and push against it with your thumb, the needle's going to come out through your finger. So hold it like a pencil. <laughs> put the small colored end against the skin. Otherwise, um, it's going to hurt. Proud oxime, same thing. OK, we're going to show you another little video here. This is talks about how to actually use the auto injector. Now this um, is directed at first responders. It's respo uh, directed at firemen. But, um, and there's two sections to it. One's how to give it to yourself and how to give it to somebody else. And it's important to know both things because if, you're, um, if you happen to be accidentally exposed while treating people, say you came in contact with some of the agents in somebody's clothing, it's good to know how to treat yourself as well. In this video segment, you'll learn how to use the Mark I auto injector. The Mark I auto injector provides first responders the antidote needed to counteract the effects of a nerve agent. The nerve agent antidote is administered using the Mark I auto injector kit. This kit contains 2 milligrams of atropine and 600 milligrams of pralidoxime chloride, or 2PAM. Notice the different size auto injectors. The smaller injector is atropine, and the larger injector is the 2PAM. The atropine is labeled number one to indicate to users to give the atropine first. The auto injector administers the antidotes through a spring-loaded injector using a 0.8 inch 18 gauge needle. Before we begin the training on how to administer the auto injectors, let's review the symptoms of exposure to a nerve agent. The acronym used to remember the effects of a nerve agent exposure is SLUDGE. SLUDGE stands for salivation, lacrimation or tearing of the eyes, urination, defecation, gastrointestinal pain and gas, and emesis, or vomiting. If you experienced any or all of the symptoms, you must immediately self-administer the nerve agent antidote. Let's begin our training on how to use the Mark I auto injector. The first step is to ensure that you have on the appropriate personal protective equipment. Don your SCBA, if not wearing one. You should check your turnout pants pockets and remove any webbing, doorstops, spanners, or other objects which may impede the auto-injector. Remove the antidote kit from the protective pouch. With your non-dominant hand, hold the auto-injectors by the plastic clip so that the larger auto-injector is on top and both are positioned in front of you at eye level. It's important not to cover or hold the needle end with your hand, thumb, or fingers because you might accidentally inject yourself. An accidental injection will not deliver an effective dose of the antidote, especially if the needle goes through your hand. Pull the atropine, the smaller auto-injector, out of the clip labeled with the number one with a smooth motion. The auto-injector is now armed. Hold the auto-injector with your thumb and two fingers, the pencil writing position. Position the green, the needle end of the injector, against the injection site, the thigh or buttock. Do not inject into areas close to the hip, knee, or thigh bone. Apply firm, even pressure, not jabbing motion, to the injector until it pushes the needle into your thigh or buttocks. Hold the injector firmly in place for at least 10 seconds. Firm pressure automatically triggers the coiled spring mechanism. Next, pull the 2-PAM injector out of the clip. Inject yourself in the same manner as the steps above holding the black end against your outer thigh for at least 10 seconds. Massage the injection sites if time permits. 
Let's take a look at how the needle activates. Using a one half inch foam core board, the needle plunges through the board without any hesitation. The atropine auto injector is dispensed quickly without any skin or muscle impeding the flow. Now let's take a look at the 2PAM auto injector. The 2PAM auto injector will take longer to dispense. If you pull the auto injector out too early, you may not receive the proper amount of the antidote. This plunges the needle through the clothing into the muscle and at the same time injects the antidote into the muscle tissue. Carefully remove the auto injector from your injection site. The needle does not break, but will bend. After administering the first set of injections, wait five to 10 minutes. You should initiate decontamination procedures as necessary and put on any remaining protective clothing. This next video segment will review the steps on how to administer the auto injector to another person. Before we start, some local EMS agencies have developed guidelines on the use of the auto injectors for other victims. You should check with your local medical director or EMS agency to determine your scope of practice. To administer the auto injector to another person, be sure as a rescuer that you're wearing the highest level of personal protective equipment available to conduct the rescue. If you have to deliver an auto injector to another person, it is likely you will still be in a hot or exclusion zone. Put an SCBA on the victim if the victim does not have respiratory protection. If the person is wearing an SCBA, check the bottle pressure. Position the victim on his or her side, the swimmer's position. Position yourself near the victim's thigh. Squat, do not kneel when masking the victim or administering the nerve agent antidotes to the victim. Kneeling may force the chemical agent into or through your protective clothing. Before administering, check the turnout pockets and remove any objects that could impede the auto injector needle. Pull the atropine or smaller auto injector out and administer it mid thigh or outside the upper buttocks. Next, pull the 2PAM injector out of the clip. Inject in the same manner as the steps above, holding the black end against outer thigh for at least 10 seconds. Secure the needle when finished with the injection. The needles from the auto injectors will bend, but not break. Let's review some key points on the use of an auto injector. Do not put finger over needle site. Hold the injector for 10 seconds. After one set of injections, initiate decontamination procedures. Severe exposure requires three Mark I kits. Atropine should be repeated until bronchospasm subsides or respiratory secretions decrease. The shelf life of the auto injectors is five years. To conduct your training on the use of the Mark I auto injectors, you'll be using a Mark I trainer to simulate application of the antidote. In order to reset the trainers, you will need two different clips. To reset the atropine auto injector, take the C-type clip and place it behind the green needle cover. Insert the C-clip until it fits snugly. With the C-clip in place, press the auto injector onto a hard surface and press vertically until a click is heard. The trainer is now reset. To reset the 2PAM auto injector, Take the end cap and place it on the top end of the auto injector. You will see two holes on the top end. The end cap will have two short prongs. Insert the cap so the prongs enter the holes. While pressing the end cap onto the auto injector, press down vertically at the same time until a click is heard. The 2PAM trainer is now reset. This concludes the video segment on auto injectors. Just uh, in terms of today's practice, don't try to reset the auto injectors. Just leave that to us because um, they are kind of fragile and they will break after a while. You'll notice too that the needles, um, you know, for the real auto injectors, when they do come out, they stay out and they don't break off. So, um, you know, you don't. You got to have some kind of sharps uh, container for all that. We used to talk about leaving the auto injectors on the patient so you could actually tell if they had it, but. Um, you don't have to do that. You can just use the clip part, which I thought I had here a second ago. If you want to leave, if you want to leave something on the patient, you can just leave part of the packaging, or leave the actual clip part, which is this part here on the on the outside. 
but the actual auto injector, the needle stays out, so it becomes a biohazardous device itself once you use a lot of them. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Therese.